All right, well, thank you all very much for sticking around. Uh, I just learned actually that apparently Puppy Palooza is up right now, so, or like five minutes, so this is about to turn into a lighting talk because I'm sure everybody wants to go do that. Um, well, actually, great, Jim already said who I was. We're all good on that. Um, we, you know, what I kind of wanted to talk about today was uh, operations and open source and what we as open source contributors and leaders really need to be thinking about and doing in the context of certainly the CNCF, um, generally cloud native and really, you know, microservices in general. So in the event you were living underneath a rock, we'll do the quick, you know, what are microservices? So we can all be on the same page. Um, they're a distributed system. They were, you know, predated by uh, enterprise service buses and SOA, which was predated by Coriba, which was predated by RPC and like on and on. Um, effectively, they are, in, in kind of my words, or I think many people's words, the Unix philosophy applied to distributed systems and scaling. So, you know, the Unix philosophy says do one thing, do it well, there's a bunch of other stuff. Um, we do that with network services. We basically say, cool, we're going to take a thing, encapsulate up data, business logic, uh, and really put that on a network behind an endpoint that is only accessible on the network, and that thing is sort of independently manageable. Um, importantly, it gives us an independent domain for logic, for data, and for sort of fault tolerance and scaling. And then, of course, we have a giant application that sort of stitches all these things together, right? This is all kind of bread and butter. Um, I do think something that has been overlooked until the last probably year or two, which I'm really glad this is becoming more of a trend, is people talking about how when we want to use microservices to scale, it applies to both technology, like we were like, oh, I'm going to build a thing that does 10 million TPS, um, but it's also the way we scale our engineering orgs and we scale in terms of people. And I think that intersection is really what you know, I want to talk about for the rest of this and just sort of like what's hard about it um, and what we want to do you know, kind of going forward or what we always just think about it. And I do think the, the kind of the last point to kind of make on that is, uh, or I guess two points, is you know, when you're building microservices, you're doing it to scale. It's the only game in town. Um, you're going to sacrifice everything in terms of complexity, cost, everything in order to get that scale. Um, and the reality of, uh, you know, when, once you go and implement this is to implement them, you have to be good at operations as an organization, and most shops aren't. And I know everybody's out there like, oh, cool, the Oracle guy's up here telling us about how enterprises aren't good at operations or, you know, the banks can't do it, et cetera. It's, it's actually everybody. Um, it doesn't matter. I've been doing this for a long time. It doesn't matter if you're talking about startups or you're talking about unicorns or, or the banks or whatever. Uh, most places, like Frankie, cool, I'm going to get some Redis and Node.js and string them together and call it a day. Um, and it's actually much harder than that if you want to succeed at scale, right? Obviously, it's all the projects you've heard about for the last day I've been talking about or the last three days. So we'll start with organizations and come back to technology at the end. Um, yes, I do know what irony means in case you're wondering. Uh, this is a comic that I've already seen for a long time, since like 2011, that kind of just describes, you know, some, some org charts. Uh, and if you looked at this from 2011, really there are a few, and I literally mean a few companies on that chart that were good at doing operations and good at building microservices. And I think, you know, we sort of started pattern matching, pattern matching ourselves to that going forward. Um, so I'll give you my very biased input on what I've seen work and kind of like how we're thinking about it as we're building all this new uh, stuff at Oracle. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time at Amazon. A lot of people have done this. Their two pizza mantra really is effective. If, if you're not familiar with it, uh, basically it's a very clever marketing term from their HR department that describes uh, basically building five to 10 person teams. Um, it works really well. What it describes as well, cool, unless you have a bunch of hungry people like me, uh, you can feed the team with two pizzas. That's kind of the, the gist. The real point of this, though, is you have these small teams that are autonomous and accountable, and you have a lot of them, right? And then they all go independently. They're not blocked on each other. They're decoupled. They own their own destiny. So when you're one of these teams, you're like, okay, I own everything about product requirements, just inception, my technology stack, operations, support, really everything. And then Amazon sort of has this classic fitness function model they apply to it, which is just like a single, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down kind of goal that you can hold the team accountable to and ultimately change over time if they meet it or don't meet it. So it works really well. It gets you scale really fast as an org, basically having a bunch of chaos. Um, what it doesn't do is have like an actual product autonomy very well. So you end up with a bunch of warring factions and tribes fight with each other, and there's all sorts of other bad sides that come with it. Um, so there's a lot of other things like from you know Apple, Google, other you know Oracle, other places in the industry that kind of blend this more sort of a centralized model. Like Google's got a very famous SRE culture. Uh, if you've not read up on the error budget stuff, I think it's actually one of the best concepts and operations in a long time. It's awesome. Um, you know, Apple's got a very centric product model, obviously, like as the chart kind of showed. Um, so I, I think you kind of want to take a blend of these things, but you know, fundamentally, you're going to have a bunch of small autonomous teams going really fast. Um, what actually happens too is, as well as you build up this organization, you have lots of people building lots of independent services. You always have kind of this like emergence of these platform teams that solve a bunch of the common crap nobody wants to build. 
right? Like, you know, so suppose we're going to be able to, we're going to be in the, we're going to be in the emoji business, right? Because that's clearly hot shit these days. Um, and, you know, the, the focus of the company is almost always towards the user-facing, customer-facing side of the world. And so the, the team that actually serves up emojis gets all the money or all the attention. Um, and then you have the kind of these teams that their customers are really internal customers that emerge to solve, you know, stuff like auth. Uh, you know, nobody ever wants to deal with storage, I mean, unless you're a masochist. Uh, nobody ever wants to deal with like kind of setting up telemetry services, et cetera. So like those kind of teams emerge to basically to serve the other teams. Um, and now, you know, importantly, remember all these people can go very fast, can choose their own destiny. Um, in the very early days, you generally find, okay, cool, the emoji team is like all aligned with the platform teams and like, you know, everybody's happy because we're all building things at the same time and that's all fine. But of course, tech moves fast. You know, 18 months in, you know, the new and emojis come out, right? And like clearly we're going to start all over because that's the new thing. Um, and there's always kind of this tension when the new teams come out or you end up with a rewrite or whatever, uh, whether to sort of bank on stability and bet on uh, what, was, what was there before or bet on innovation or fashion, right? So, you know, you're, you're always going to have this kind of tension, which is frankly good um, in terms of what the technology stack is going to look like in any one of these teams. Um, maybe. There we go. So regardless of which... Uh, which kind of team you are, like you're one of these teams, you're still gonna have to solve your problems. You're still gonna have to pick a stack. It ends up looking the same for everybody. Um, it's 2017, the reality of what everybody's gonna do is they're gonna use a mix of cloud and open source, right? So what I've been saying for a long time or tell, I've told people for a long time, like cloud at its root is outsourced operations. Like at the end of the day, that's what you're paying for. Like, because of course, if you could run everything yourself, like of course you would, you want to, but the reality is it's expensive and you probably can't. So, you know, typically people are going to use as much cloud as they can because what you're getting is effectively like a financial contract of how to achieve an SLA from somebody else and you can, you know, hold them over a barrel whenever they break that. But a lot of times it doesn't work for you, right? Like the interfaces are wrong, the SLAs don't meet your needs. Like you're going to have to like not, you're going to always end up in this kind of build versus buy versus blend mode. So you're going to use as much as cloud as you can because it's easy. And then when you're not going to be able to use cloud, you're going to use open source, right? That's, that's the reality. And you're going to use open source very specifically because it gives you transparency. So if you're the team that's accountable for your destiny, for your destiny, like top to bottom, like what other choice do you have besides to bet on software that you can crack under open and get under the hood and actually introspect everything and understand it? Like it's super important. So this is why, like this is the state of the world. This is all obvious, I think, at this point, or it's sort of self-evident by the industry. But that's what you're going to do. Um, you know, kind of the interesting thing is there's this ton of stuff out there, right? So, you know, I can poke a little fun at this given, you know, Oracle just announced we're part of the CNCF now. This is the CNCF landscape page. I'm sure you've all seen it. There's a ton of shit up there, right? Like, there's a lot of stuff. Um, and the, uh, there's awesome, right? Like, it's, you know, we're exponentially better off this year than we were last year and, like, orders of magnitude than a decade ago, I can guarantee you. But the reality is none of that stuff actually works together, right? Like, it, it doesn't. You have all these things that kind of go independently and some things are good and some things are crap and somebody's to put it all together. And this is always much harder than everybody thinks. So you end up like as a team that you have to build this, you know, you're going to build the Animoji service and we're going to go kill it on the iPhone, whatever it is now, X10, I don't even know. Um, you know, you're going to have to spend a lot more time than you think putting all this software together. Like this is, this is the fundamental problem most places end up to and you end up with just a ton of, uh, you know, reinventing the wheel. Um, it's always uh, very difficult for people to come up with an executable plan that gets them uh, to meet their SLA goals. Frankie, as I said at the very beginning, a bunch of people don't do that. They kind of start with like, well, I'll put some stuff from Redis and Node.js together and call it a day. Um, that works for a while until you actually get some success. And then, of course, it burns to the ground and you have Twitter fail whales or, you know, whatever the, whatever the meme is these days. So it's hard is the real point to this. And I guess the point to now wrap this up or, you know, bring it home so everybody can go pet puppies. Um, you know, open source has always been about uh, transparency and empowering end users, right? Like back in the day, uh, I don't I, 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 Chris raised the hands of how many people were not here before. You know, Microsoft was the devil, right? Like, oh, we're all getting locked into Windows on our laptops and we hate them. We have to have Linux on the desktop. It's coming in a year now. Awesome. By the way, Microsoft, we love you now. We know you're awesome. Um, but that, like, that's, that's what it existed for way back then, right? And, and now the world is a little bit changed. Like today, the cloud industry and sort of the distributed systems industry has been, clearly been built up. Uh, around open source and it has to empower teams, like as it's doing today. So I'm not telling you this because it doesn't do it, obviously it does, but there's more we have to do. So my real argument to all of us in the room is we have to think about how we empower teams better going forward uh, to build operation software, or build software that can be operable. And it really means be consumed by one of these team, by one of these organizations that's building microservices. So I actually had a ton of stuff on the first version of this slide, like we can talk about like, it's hard with versioning and deployment and stuff. I tried to boil it down to like a very small set of like three things that everybody could like kind of take away. 
And the point of this, I think, is more to have a discussion than actually like a mandate. So this is just my mental model. Like number one, this is really a reflection of what's hard. Uh, it's actually very hard for people to consume software and deploy it. Obviously, Kubernetes and Docker really have changed the world, and that does help a lot. So I think that one is the one that is the easiest line of sight to have, great, we, have, uh, we do that. That makes that problem a lot better. But we still have to do it. Um, the other two, I think, are not quite so simple. Um, so observability is always like the, when you have to operate software, right? Like the, the, the Jaeger stuff is awesome. It really is. Um, you know, we, we've, we've all been building crap from scratch for the last 10 years to operate software. Uh, observability really is like the root important thing you have to have. But there's always kind of this thing I think that people think, well, because I get this like x-ray or microscope, I now understand everything. And the reality is you're not going to. Um, like in the system space, we've had D-Trace and System Trap and all these other system tap, all these other like amazing tools uh, that help us understand what's going on in the operating system itself. But the reality is, unless you're a kernel developer or Brendan Gregg, you're probably not going to figure out what all that stuff is. So, you know, the, the real burden then is sort of like giving the person that has to consume this operation, the software, the ability to operate it in their environment when what they care about is building like an Animoji service or whatever. So, I think the way that we get there is by saying, as software authors, like, it's, it's on us to pre-instrument software. It's on us to like basically say, okay, I understand uh, what people need to look for more than better than anybody. I understand what people need to look for. I understand what they need to do when one of these alarms gets caught. Certainly give me the trace points and tell me what the trace points are. Uh, as ideally, give me a dashboard that I can just quickly drop in and get going with. Like, I think that's a huge one. Like, more than anything, that'd be the number one thing I think uh, we as open source authors need to start focusing on when we build projects that are meant to scale. Um, and the other one is, it kind of just to t goes hand in hand with that, is testability. Um, and I don't run, mean that like when I run make test, I get Unicode check marks or whatever the cool thing is to do these days. Um, it's really that I, that I can do actual proper chaos testing. And chaos testing is we all, you know, chaos monkey, everybody kind of runs in AWS and it blows stuff up. And that's actually kind of easy to reason about. Um, I, I always find like what's difficult is blackout versus brownout testing. Brownout testing is much harder to deal with. So, you know, what, what we have to do though is like, and, you know, you have to assume that if you're building one of these online massive, you know, consumer facing web scale systems, you're going to be doing production testing. You're going to be blowing stuff up in production because if you're not doing that, uh, you actually have no idea if your system can recover. Like most places, the production environment is so large, you literally can't recreate it. So it's the only place you can actually do this. Um, so it's on us as software authors to assume that that's the environment these things are going into and give people sort of the, 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 the explainability and the consumability to go run that and tell them like what to look for, how it's going to break, and like how to you know, validate that it's recovered. And obviously this goes hand in hand with, the, with observability. So I told you to be a lightning talk. Uh, I think I'm two minutes ahead of schedule. So I'll get through this in 60 seconds or less, so puppies. Um, how is Oracle going to help uh, is, I, I think, kind of like tie this all back up. So, you know, we, we announced we're in the CNCF today. We're going to make that mean something, um, I, I'm sincerely. Um, we've already announced that we're putting a lot of people and a lot of effort into Kubernetes. We've been doing a lot on federation and SIG testing specifically. We're going to keep doing a lot more there. Um, we've put out some tools ourselves that we find super useful, specifically at targeted sort of operability and security. So one of these is CrashCart. That's my personal favorite. It lets you kind of like debug. Uh, post-mortem any crash containers. It's awesome. Check it out. It's on our GitHub. Um, we're going to keep putting a lot into this. This is, you know, very passionate. This is a super huge uh, belief of mine that, like, operations is actually the hard part of building cloud systems and building microservices. So this is where we're going to see a ton of effort from us. Um, we believe in it very fervently. And, you know, of course, open world is coming up. That's like Christmas time at Oracle, so there's going to be a ton of announcements. But stay tuned to us around stuff around open source specifically. And, you know, over the next year, there's going to be a lot more from us coming on this. So thank you, everybody.